Good morning, good evening, wherever you may be around the city and across the state, coming to you from the heart of Chicago, it is e-learning with Mr. Moeller. On today's show, we're going to be doing our intro to United States history, the course, as well as social science, what we're actually going to be doing this year. So just a friendly reminder, if you're watching this video, Cristo Rey of 2020, uh, you have a little assignment to do along with it. It's going to help you practice some of these skills. So I guess we'll start off the year by just talking about what are we going to be doing in class? What is history? What is social science? And so the way we understand history is very, very simple. History is the way that we study the events of the past in order to explain the present. Think about who you are today as a junior or a senior in high school. Imagine now all the things that led to that point, all of your experiences, your beliefs. That is what we're talking about when we're talking about history. And so the way that we do that is through something called social science. In order to actually study something, you have to have a method. And so what social science does is it applies the scientific method of inquiry and analysis uh, in order to understand our human experiences both now as well as in the past. So we don't time travel in this class, unfortunately, but there's a lot of ways we can actually tell what it was like to be living in another era. And so social science for us, just a quick definition here, uh, it's going to be scientific methods similar to uh, biology, chemistry, or physics. We're going to ask a question. We're going to collect data. We're going to analyze it, draw conclusions. And uh, in this class, we're not going to make statements without any evidence or proof. There is no, well, I think, or well, in my opinion, everything is should be backed up by evidence. There should always be evidence. And so what we do with the scientific method in this class, another discipline um, of kind of the social sciences, is we apply that method to human choices and interactions, whether it be the interaction of society, uh, the interaction of kind of how we work and get resources, or the study of power and how it's exercised. These are the tools that we use to understand what kind of the past is like. And so first and foremost, the first rule here. I don't know, therefore aliens is never an excuse for anything. There should always be evidence to support conclusions and you shouldn't trust people just because they tell you something is true. And I'm saying that as your teacher. There should be real quantitative data, measurable metrics, like how tall are the people in Mr. Moeller's class? Or there should be primary documents from that event, pictures, um, you know, artwork, someone's journal, diary, a newspaper, video, anything that's gonna document our life that we're living now. Your social media page is actually one of the best primary sources that future historians are going to have to talk about now. And so the last piece is you always want to look for secondary documentation, synthesis, events, trends, what we call history and the conclusions that we draw. For instance, questions like why did the Civil War happen or, you know, what was the significance of the Civil Rights Act of 1964? Um, we can ask these questions and others have. And so we can look at how other people answered those same questions and evaluate their evidence. And so when I say evidence is really important, here's what I mean. New evidence can actually change the entire understanding that we have about a past event. For instance, in the modern era, the Cuban Missile Crisis, um, huge nuclear event that almost caused nuclear war, um, once government documents were declassified, it was actually found out that Nikita Khrushchev of the Soviet Union had a much larger role to play in actually stopping this confrontation from happening. We never would have known if we didn't get that additional evidence. Um, the way that we're talking about COVID-19 is another example of new evidence. As the story kind of keeps changing, as new data comes out, we're constantly adapting. And then finally, my favorite one is the discovery of the Rosetta Stone. Very, very simple tablet, no, not the language software, um, that had the same passage in multiple languages, which actually allowed for modern historians to go back and decrypt ancient languages that we once thought were lost. And so new evidence always brings with it some sort of new conclusions. And so once you have all that evidence, you have to find a way of putting it all together, almost like a puzzle. And so various lenses, economics, uh, politics, sociology, culture, um, they're like puzzle pieces that help us piece together a very important event. Um, everything has something to do with money. Everything has something to do with power and everything has something to do with cultural identity in some way, shape or form. You put the three together, you get a better sense of what the world was looking like at the time you're looking. So I want you to just for a second, think about a big decisions that you made recently. Just imagine in your mind's eye. 
So as you were thinking about this decision, I'm sure you considered how much it would cost or what you would have to give up. Well, that's just simple economics, right? Um, you probably asked, like, was I allowed to do this, right? Is this within the rules and laws? Well, that's politics. People having power over you and setting boundaries as to your actions. And you probably factored in more than anything else how other people would see you, whether it's peers or family or maybe teachers. And so how other people react to you, well, that's sociology. And so you've actually been doing this pretty much your entire life without knowing it. And so when we look at history, we are looking at the same thing. It is people just like you who were just born in a different time, making complex choices in the time and place where they lived. And that's the most important thing. We have to place every event within the context surrounding it. And so in this intro unit, we're gonna cover a couple of core skills. We're gonna cover geography and how to really use a map, data using charts, graphs, and tables. We're gonna look at how you analyze an image, be it a cartoon, a photograph, or a video. And we're gonna look at the basic social sciences of economics, political science, and sociology. So buckle up, it's gonna be a fun year. So our first stop on uh, in this intro unit is gonna be looking at map and data literacy, because this is gonna help us in every single unit that we look at this year. So this is just a friendly reminder to please check your vocab list in the unit one tab of your OneNote, as you are responsible for a number of terms that we're gonna be using for the rest of the year. So just to start off, why maps? Why bother? Well, geography matters. Whether you are at the North Pole or in the Amazon rainforest is really going to affect the way that you're going to live your life, isn't it? And so weather, resources, the ecosystem of a particular place, the lifestyle of the people live, as well as the great distances between places like, say, you know, the United States uh, and China are going to really kind of come together to really shape a lot of the human experience. So being able to look at geography is to understand where people are going to live and how that's going to affect them. So just a few quick reminders about uh, directions. So if you ever use the compass, which Mr. Moeller still uses, I don't have a smartphone, I use a compass to navigate. Um, the, basically it works with magnets. Um, the Earth's magnetic poles are going to move it. And so therefore, north, south, east, and west are called cardinal directions, meaning that they never change. So north is always north, south is always south as opposed to this idea of relative directions like, oh, turn left, turn right, that can change depending on how you're looking at it. And so remember your cardinal directions. Every map has a compass rose that's gonna let you know what north, south, east, and west are, but usually um, up is gonna be north on a standard map. And so if we look at this map right here, it's very clear to see that Cicero is not left of Chicago, Cicero is indeed west of Chicago. Um, so secondly, let's take a look at kind of some of the components uh, of the map here. So down here in the bottom, we have what is known as the scale. So the scale is a really great way for us to tell how far apart are things actually, right? Um, obviously, everything is relative. And so if I want to see, you know, how far would it, you know, would it actually be from Atlanta, you know, to Ohio, I can actually look at this map and I could figure out the distances between them. And so it's a very big thing. Make sure you always check that. Um, also, every single map has a title. And so if you look at the title, usually it'll just tell you exactly what the map is about and you won't have any you know, misconceptions or bad thoughts about that. Um, also in the bottom right, um, which I am covering up, unfortunately, um, is the key or legend. And you know what this is. It's the thing that tells you what's on the map. It tells you that blue lines are rivers or that you know certain things um, are capitals. And so we always look at that so we can tell what is this map trying to show me. And so, yeah. So moving on from maps, I just want to talk a little bit about this idea of data and data literacy. So when we talk about using data, data can be numbers, but it doesn't have to be. Data is any measurable variable. So like public opinion, um, you know, how popular is Mr. Moeller versus Ms. Schulte? Um, you could look at wages. How much do people actually make? Um, what percentage of population are immigrants? You can see on the table on the right. And so we represent these measurable variables either as a data set, which you see on the right, a table that just has all the numbers, or visualization, aka a graph. So data is one of the most useful things we have in drawing really good conclusions about how kind of things really are. 
but they can also be very, very easily manipulated. So be very, very careful as bad stats are used often to fool people. And so there's three steps to looking at any map. One, read the data. Two, judge its reliability and its usefulness to you. And three, analyze for patterns and conclusions, which is ultimately what you're doing with any evidence in any sort of thing you might be doing. So when we read the data, first things we got three key questions. One, what is the title? I cannot emphasize this enough. The title usually tells you exactly what you're looking at so you won't get confused. Secondly are the variables, the X and Y axes, right? The X axis um, is the one that is running horizontal, the Y runs vertical. And so these tell us what is being measured and how it's being measured. So for instance, in this graph, uh, what we are looking at are immigrants as a percentage of the US population versus the total number of immigrants. And so we can actually see here that the total number um, doesn't always coincide with immigrants as a percentage of the population. So you can see um, kind of in the 1970s and 80s, more immigrants than ever before, but as a percentage, they were actually lower. And so that tells us something about population in general in the United States. And so we look at how data is displayed. This is a line graph uh, meant to kind of compare a couple of things. There are also bar graphs, there are pie charts. And so these also have scale in units. Uh, the scale must always be the same. As you can see on this, um, they are moving forward in history every 20 years on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, they're moving up by five percentage points or by five million people. And so very, very important to look at <coughs> what is the scale and is the scale reliable? Because one of the most easy things to manipulate in a graph is actually those numbers on the X and Y axes. And so then we look at the same data and we judge, is it reliable? Who made it? Is it trustworthy? Do they have an agenda? What kind of data is it? Is it records? Is it surveys? Um, is it a comprehensive? Is it every single person? Or is it a sample, just a small group of people meant to represent a greater number of people? And so common problems could be that your sample bias, the group of people you talk to, just simply isn't good enough. For instance, if I interviewed sophomores about their favorite junior teacher, that really wouldn't be a very good measure um, about junior teachers. Um, also collection biases. Um, I could just ask the right questions to get the right results, and I can also screw up uh, the, representation, the representation of it by messing around with my graph formatting. Uh, this is one of my favorite graphs kind of to the right. Respondents who can't imagine life without internet. This is an online poll. So everyone they are polling already pretty much can't live without the internet. So then we look at these things and we analyze them. We look for trends, we look for patterns. What stands out about the information? How does the information compare uh, to you know, other stuff? And so um, one of the big things is how do different variables seem to affect each other in different ways. And so as you can see on this map, I'm sorry, not this map, gosh, uh, this chart, we can see that actually North America has very, very low rates um, of pollution. But we notice that in South Asia, it's very high and it's actually expanding, it's actually getting bigger. And so something that I could look at and ask a question about is what is happening in South Asia that their deaths from air pollution are actually going up when it seems like a lot of the worlds um, are actually kind of lessening uh, at this time, at least compared uh, to like 1990. And so when we draw conclusions, we're looking at the evidence and trying to ask like, what does this evidence mean? So a couple of traps uh, that you might fall into. Uh, one is correlation versus causation. Just because two things look like they're connected does not actually mean that they caused each other. Um, for instance, if uh, I asked you guys, you know, what your favorite food was and the overwhelming majority of you said pizza, um, I really couldn't make any big conclusion about like, well, at 16 years of age, people love pizza. Um, and so any data you look at, you have to make sure that there's an actual connection between the things you're talking about. Also, you can have misleading representations. Um, this is a really great bad data set. If you look at the average home price, um, the, the scale is so low, only going up uh, by $500, that it looks like there's a massive increase in home price when actually it's gone up by less than $2,000. And so 
you always got to be on the lookout because stats can be easily used to fool people. So be looking out for faulty polls. Um, be looking for non-representative samples. Be looking for incomplete data. Um, because if the data you have is bad or the graph is bad, well, then you're not going to be able to draw much, ev much evidence or conclusion from it. And so this is just our reminder now that we've kind of looked at these things a little bit to check out your OneNote assignment. Your first activity packet is going to take you through a series of maps as well as data representations to better practice these skills that we talked about today. So have a great rest of your day and we'll see you next time.